session, I mean, the speech session will be conducted by Dr. Raihan M. Sharif, Associate Professor of the Department of English, Jahanginoka University. So now I would like to request Dr. Raihan Sharif uh, to start conducting the sessions, which include session of speech and the question answer session. Uh, Dr. Raihan Sharif. Thank you, um, Professor Hussain. Um, so we are all excited uh, to um, hear our uh, speaker, uh, Professor Slav and Gretje. Um, just you know, uh, before Slav you know uh, start his uh, session, I would like to provide a brief bio of uh, Professor Slav and Gretje. Slav and Gretje is an associate professor of Spanish at Marshall University, USA. He's a recipient of Distinguished Artist and Scholar Award. Dr. Slav is the author or editor of eight books, um, and they are The Polyphonic World of Cervantes and Dostoevsky, published in 2017, and um, Don Quixote, The re accentuation of the World's Greatest 17, Bakhtin's Heritage, Literature, Art, and Psychology, 2018, Dialogues with Slavsky, the Duovican Interview, 1967 uh, to 1968, published in 2019. Viktor Slavsky's Heritage in Literature, Arts and Philosophy, published in 2019. Mikhail Bakhtin, The Duovican Interview, 1973, published in 2019. Don Quixote, Around the Globe, published in 2020. That's exciting. And The Poetic of Avogad in Literature, Arts and Philosophy, published in 2020. In addition, he has published numerous articles on Cervantes, Dostoevsky, and Bakhtin in various journals, including Cervantes, College Literature, the South Atlantic Review, Comparative Literature and Culture, the Russian Review, and the Novokovian. So um, with this, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Slavin Gratchev uh, to start his session. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for inviting me. I think it is an excellent opportunity for us to speak with people from Bangladesh, with faculty from Bangladesh and students from Bangladesh. Actually, your part of the world has always been on my list to visit. So hopefully someday uh, you will invite me to come to your university. So for some symposium, I will be delighted to do it. So today, when I was deliberating the topic uh, I was thinking, should I talk about things that interest me, for example, my research activities, or should I took more, uh, take, take time and talk uh, about things that interest you, the audience? So, And I thought that probably I would try to share my experiences and my observations of more than 25 years being in North America, in Canada and the United States, about the academic careers in North America. So there was a suggestion uh, also, please reserve your questions at the end once I finish, but so that you will not forget them, probably it will be convenient if you just jot them down on a piece of paper and then you will easily come back to what you wanted to ask. Okay, so I will start from, some of you are familiar with them, but there will be something that you are not familiar with. So uh, the system of education in North America is quite straightforward, quite straightforward. It is a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and PhD, a doctor of philosophy degree. So these three major uh, things that encapsulate the whole system of North American education. Master's degree and PhD are considered to be an academic degree, meaning that you can already get a job in academia. With a bachelor's degree, you are not qualified to get a job in academia. There's a belief, a widespread belief, for example, that the American education uh, does, not really, does not really follow uh, European well-established and classical education, which is true. And I believe that uh, I had a chance to study and work in Spain also, as, as well as in Russia, 
and also to observe the European education in comparison with American. Let's put it in quotation mark, kind of a dictatorship from the Ministry of Education in European countries. They try to design the whole system of education for everyone across the country. American education seems to be like a chaos, but it only on the surface. But in reality, every single university is developing their own system by inviting the best academics to create their own programs. So practically, each university at the end can boast uh, by creating their own system of education. For example, uh, University John Hopkins University in Baltimore uh, is well known for developing the system of seminars. At this university, if you want to hear lectures, don't go there because they, they will never offer you a lecture. They're always, always 100% all classes are delivered in the form of the seminar. Some people may not like it, but this is the reality. If you don't like it, then don't go to uh, John Hopkins University. So they stay on the side of the dialogue. So behind this seemingly chaos in quotation mark in America, each university is unique in its own way. And it gives you, for example, folks, uh, uh, thinking about coming to the US or Canada to study, uh, opportunity to research a particular university and say, I think probably this university will be the best fit for me. There are smaller university, uh, universities like mine, for example, 17,000 people. And there are bigger university monsters like Purdue. Uh, where I graduated from, which is about 40,000 students university. They're much more powerful. They have more resources. They have more money. And, but the atmosphere is certainly different. And there are very small colleges. They call them, for example, liberal arts colleges. They are excellent, but there's only 3,000 students. And the focus, they focus, yes, uh, the prestige of those colleges is very high, nonetheless. Why? Because they were able to attract such a brilliant faculty on board who developed such an interesting programs that these colleges stand in competition with these big Purdue and Yale and Princeton and John Hopkins. So this is the kind of a major, uh, major difference between European in the, um, North American education. Few more things. In Europe, it is more geared to memorization of the information, in my opinion, and again, based on my observations. Uh, you learn from the professor. So you have to become lucky to meet a professor who is excellent and you learn from him. But even if you are not lucky and don't meet such a brilliant professor, you still have to learn from the professor because he is kind of the boss. And the idea is listen to me and do what I say or say what I have said. They want to hear you memorize the information that has been provided. They guide you to the certain books, for example. They want you to make notes of their lectures. And then you have to, if you want to be successful, you have to respond accordingly. You have to tell them everything what you have learned from them. So this approach, although good in many ways, this is how I was educated first time in Russia where I received my first master's degree. It's still very theoretical in my opinion and does not really apply to practice. I remember when I finished my master's degree in Russia and I came to teach to the university as an instructor. At that time, I was absolutely lost. I discovered that I did not learn anything how to really walk into the classroom, how to do this stuff. 
my head was full of knowledge, but I did not know how to put this knowledge to work. So that was my very frustrating months before I finally realized what I'm really supposed to do. I'm still kind of going back in my memories. I'm still feeling a little embarrassed <laughs> how interesting and I was, I looked in front of my students because I really, it really showed up that I was not really able to do it. On the other hand, what I want to point out that American education is geared towards practice, hands on. They want you to try everything on your own. And again, it, it can kind, kind of be shocking for graduate students to come to the United States. Uh, and some of you who studied there probably will confirm that, right? So you are mostly on your own. And the professor, he adopts the attitude, show me your own ideas. Yes, I'm willing to share my ideas with you, but still, I want to see your own ideas. Approach is kind of, surprise me, please. Bring something interesting, bring something new to me so that I know that you are smart. And based on that, you're getting your grade. Uh, so practically, uh, they are supporting the search for new ideas from the very first step. And in the beginning, when you are not feeling prepared, you're thinking, I'm not an academic yet. How can I find any of these ideas? Yes, you still can. And you try to do it and you learn to do it step by step little by little. Again, I remember when I was doing my master's degree in Spanish and Latin American studies in Canada. So that was I encountered and few first months were kind of frustrating because I had to do the job on my own. There was nobody who was taking my hand and just kind of pointing me out. Uh, those are the books that you have to take, read, and tell me what is inside. So this love for fresh ideas and independent thinking, probably this is when the whole idea of American Canadian academia is being fermented. Love for fresh ideas. They want you and they urge you to be on your own. But on the other hand, as I was making a kind of metaphoric comparison, so you will be like a Titanic. So in a big ocean. So you have to learn how to navigate in this ocean. And if you do not learn this navigation system, then you will be hitting these small icebergs, not necessarily big ones, right? So because you will not sink. Uh, and you will be experiencing these difficulties, but they believe that these difficulties are good. And eventually, eventually, when the frustration disappears, you feel that, yes, these differences, difficulties were really helpful. You learned a great deal while you were navigating through all these big and smaller obstacles. Uh, uh, so this is another a little thing that kind of prepares you prepares you well from the day one, from the step one for the future academic career in North America. Also, there was a widespread belief that America reminds people of some a huge vacuum cleaner. But of course, it doesn't clean, but it just sucks in the mines from the wall. I believe probably it is true because uh, big mines and interesting mines are always attracted to North America, Canada and the US, and they're very welcoming to these mines. If you have some interesting ideas to bring, there will be people, there will be organization, organizations that are interested in these ideas and they will try to do the best to accommodate these ideas practically, to help you to develop these ideas. Uh, it really does seem that they're constantly in search for people 
with something to offer. Example probably would be my department. My department again is small, there's only 10 people. Uh, I have been here almost 10 years. So I was hired, just think of this, as a professor of Spanish being Russian, who was educated in Canada for Spanish, quite unusual. The second person was hired, she's Polish. She was educated in the United States, in Georgia. Also another professor of Spanish. So see, uh, it means there's no limit for any person to become who you want to become, in my opinion. To become a professor of Spanish for the Russian in America is very difficult, but it's doable. For me to become a professor of Spanish in Spain, and I'm telling you this for the fact because uh, I go to Spain every single summer. I live there for about a couple months or three months. I work there a few times. It is not absolutely possible. Just it is not possible. All the department is only Spanish. Spanish period. No one can get in. Even if you have a uh, doctorate degree in Harvard, they still are not interested in you. To be very shameful, just the latest news that I heard in Madrid, the biggest university in Madrid, they just passed the law that professors who want to work in Madrid, they have to graduate from University of Madrid. It is kind of a nonsense, right? So they, it used to be very difficult to get in, but now it is practically impossible to get in. <laughs> so they're limiting the possibilities for people instead of opening the doors. So we'll see the consequences of this, but that was the latest news from my colleagues when they told me, did you hear this? This is what they just passed. So coming back to the North America, again, see, I want to kind of give you a sensation, an idea, my belief that this is the place with open doors if you have an ideas and if you have a desire to get through all the to jump through all the hoops and difficulties and obstacles of just real life. It may take you enough time, but still, once you do the requirement, everything will just happen on time. So you just have to follow the certain, uh, the certain prescribed route. On the other hand, I want to caution you because I've seen many people who were trying to come here, you were com they were coming here and trying to get a job, relying on the education that they received in their own countries, thinking, I already received my PhD in my country. I don't understand why they don't want to recognize it and hire me as a professor. It is not unfortunately likely to happen. Well, they're a little bit protective on their job market in this regard. And second, as I was trying to say, uh, they know about the differences and they believe in their own education. They believe that if you go through the uh, apprenticeship, then you will be better prepared to teach, to research, to do the research in this particular country. So a friend of mine who came to the United States with a PhD degree, believe it or not, in psychology, quickly realized that he cannot get anything. Then he enrolled, he applied for the PhD degree again in the University of Rochester in New York, finished the whole course in six years, defended the dissertation, became a PhD from Rochester and immediately got a job in Canada. Now, right now, he's already an author of a couple of books, full professor, and everything happened to him just as it should have been. So this is, this is the kind of a thing. We discussed this with him many times. He was saying, I was so happy. I was so glad that I 
did my PhD in Rochester because now looking back, I realized that yes, I knew something, but I really did not know what they want me to do, what they expect me to do. So practically he was very grateful to the six years of his apprenticeship doing the second PhD, so to speak, in the United States. Uh, now, imagine that you will come and complete your studies. So about the financial opportunities for the research, uh, I have never seen anywhere an opportunity. So I don't want to sound kind of I'm praising America so highly. No, there are difficulties in everything. So it's just a normal standard life like everybody. But still, nonetheless, nonetheless, there is a tremendous research opportunities once you become a faculty member. And if you have, again, if you have an idea, if you have something to offer, for example, just recent, another example, my book number nine uh, has been accepted for publication by Toronto University Press. This is one of the leading presses, academic presses in the world. So I was very happy. But because of these economic hardships, you understand, I was trying to get my book published during this pandemic. Uh, they said that they are really looking forward for the subvention from me, kind of to help them to publish the book. The money were not huge, maybe about a couple thousand dollars, but still. I went back to my administration and administration supported my quest, right? Because it was, they just practically supplied the money for the university, supporting my uh, research project, supporting the book. It was very pleasant. Right. So this is the kind of an attitude of universities and administration uh, in America uh, that they really do support you in terms of financial, in the moments of financial hardships, when you really need to do something. Uh, and another thing, I'm just looking at my little list. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. Just one moment. Um, on the other hand, so first of all, the departments, the colleges and universities, they have a specific dedicated money that they are willing to distribute and disperse for their uh, viable research. So on the other hand, knowing this, there's so many incredible amount of opportunities, uh, as I call this, the outside money, outside grants. So, and if you are a good researcher, and if you are a persistent person, if you know what you're doing, and again, if you have an idea uh, that you want to present, prove, and defend, there's an incredible amount of opportunities, financial opportunities for academics uh, to support and finance their research. So you just practically look for the grants, you write the proposals professionally, you have to prove that your proposal really stands the scrutiny. And if you do, then you get, you get this grant. I probably received about 20 grants in this, maybe even more. So uh, ranging from 2000 maybe to $10,000. So see, and this is the external grant opportunities money that exists in this country uh, nationwide. So you don't have to be confined to specifically to your state or to your university, you just do your own search, proof. Yes, you have to be accountable. You have to show them that you 
produce things and these things uh, are needed. They have an academic value. There's experts who are standing behind these who scrutinize all your proposals, but still, if you, if you have these ideas and you can defend them, there's an opportunity for that. Mm, to cover your expenses, for example, uh, uh, for travel money, uh, for instance, each department normally has a very substantial amount of money that you can use, let's say maybe $2,000 per year that you can go practically, it is sufficient to go almost to any country uh, to attend any conference where you will be presenting a paper, uh, a significant paper, right? So uh, I remember last time I went to Moscow and Moscow is a very expensive city. So again, uh, $2,000 that were distributed normally from the department were not sufficient to cover it. Again, there are some other little travel grants that you can keep searching, find out. And I was able to get again, additional $1,500 to cover, you know, all these extra expenses that were occurring again. So this is the very pleasant thing to be in academia and feel and know that they are supporting you in every possible way to do what you want to do. Uh, so I was talking about this. Uh, yes, uh, in, my, in, my little, in my little abstract, I said, that the professor here, an academic, is becoming practically an entrepreneur. So you, you're absolutely on your own. Let's just put it this way. I don't have to ask the permission from my chair or from the dean, should I go to this such and such conference or I should not? Should I try to publish such and such book or I should not? Or maybe you are not interested in this topic. No. I just completely do everything on my own. So, and the professor, the academic is becoming a complete 100% entrepreneur. If you are entrepreneurial, then you can search for these external grants that I was just trying to uh, describe and uh, cover everything. So practically uh, on top of your standard salary, right? Uh, you're becoming kind of a businessman in a good sense. So you're not making money on this, but to promote your personal research, you have to become this entrepreneurial, entrepreneur and a businessman, but it pays off. And on the other hand, you feel that the administration is standing behind you. They are not trying ever to stop you. Uh, and if you come to them, and explain to them the reasons, they try to help you. Even in, uh, when the times are tough, still. They were, uh, you remember about the University of Toronto grant, right? So they were able to help me even during the time of pandemic, which was especially appreciative, right? So, uh, administrators, huh? Uh, another little thing, again, still <laughs> worth mentioning. So every university, in particular our university, has a whole system of internal awards. And these awards, they are not just an award. I remember when I, I received my first award as a best instructor back in Russia. So I received a piece of paper. <laughs> And with this piece of paper, there was absolutely nothing that came out of this, right? A little piece of paper. You, are, you were recognized by students, students as the best instructor of the year. Thank you for good work. So they shook my hand and that was it. So here, the system of these awards, first of all, you have to be nominated, not by your chair. Again, it doesn't matter if you have a good relationship with the chair or if he or she likes you or does not like you. It has no bearings on you. You can be nominated by your students or by the colleague, someone from inside the university. And once you get this nomination, you enter in a fair competition. 
the committee that is assigned completely outside of the department. So people who sometimes don't know you, they just looking at all your achievements, at all your papers. Uh, and then they decide if they need, they come to observe your class, for example, if it is a teaching award, let's put it this way. If it is an academic award, they evaluate your academic achievements. Last year, I received the most prestigious university award as a distinguished scholar and artist. I'm not an artist, I'm just a scholar. So, but this is the combined award. So, and these awards are quite monetary wise, quite substantial. And uh, also they, uh, they bring some other incentives, like for example, one of the awards comes with, you know, for example, the most, the most recent, the most modern uh, iPad, iPad, plus the release from teaching couple courses in the next following semester. So they normally, if you have to teach, let's say three courses per semester, they say the next semester you will be teaching only one course. So they just release you from others, recognizing your achievements as an academic, as a scholar. So see, and people enter into these competitions in a fair and win in a fair game. And I honestly believe in the fairness of these as I was saying, right? So because the committees that are formed, uh, even when you go for the promotion, I will give you this example, even with, when you go for the promotion from assistant professor to associate professor, in the committees, uh, they remove from your personal department so that they do not, let's say you don't have a good relationship with a colleague in your department, it happens, right? So we're all people. And these people cannot make or participate in the decision of the motion or not promotion. Again, another very smart little detail that has been thought through very carefully so that nothing stops you from being who you are. And if you are good, then you just continue doing your work, right? So there is nothing personal, let's put it this way just business. University is interested in you becoming better and better in spite of anything. And this is a very rewarding experience, I have to say, based on my almost 10 years at this university. Um, okay, now to the more practical things. Again, you remember I was talking about, this is a kind of a theoretical background, first-hand experiences. I just shared my own uh, kind of things. Uh, how to come to study to the graduate programs to the United States, because this is how everything starts, right? Uh, maybe I will say some common things, but just in case, I still would prefer to say them. First of all, remember you uh, as a, graduate student will be evaluated based on your achievements, right? For example, your grades. So you have to be super, super heavily worker, heavy worker. Hi, because they will be seeing your papers. Uh, this is very important. You will not be taking any particular uh, exam pertaining to your profession, you may have an interview with them via Skype, for example. This is when they may ask you some specific questions. It happens, I know, not always, but it does happen. Uh, but generally, you have to be constantly thinking about your transcript, as we call them, right? So that your grades really show them who you are. And the second, the major component is, of course, English. So you are the majority of you probably, right? Students coming from this English department. So your English is supposed to be good. But remember one thing, you have to still prove them that your English is good. And taking an exam is not easy. 
even the native speaker will not pass this exam if he or she comes to take it because it is an exam. It is a special, special, special skill that you have to develop. You have to think so fast. You have to answer properly. You have to absorb the information. Uh, you have to read passages at a certain very high speed and then answer. And these passages may be coming from a different, like biology or ar archaeology, geography, whatever it can be. So they will be tasting you all in and out. So practically, I'm talking about right now the uh, TOEFL exam. So uh, this TOEFL exam takes about three hours to pass. And uh, this is where they will be testing your English professionalism. So uh, lots of people who thought that they are excellent in this, they failed. Uh, preparation for this exam is essential. But this is the first step. It is not that important. I mean, it is important, but it is not that terribly important. The second step is more important. It's called GRE, Graduate Record Examination Test, which lasts five hours. Com completely computerized right now, right? But because of this computerized thing, it can be done, let's say, in Bangladesh easily. Right, so in a certain center, you just come, they can find you, and you there. Uh, I believe that there's a couple, couple moments when you can interrupt and go for the, uh, for the bathroom, and then come back and continue. So this exam requires, in my estimate, in my personal experience, from six to eight months of preparation, specifically. So it tests you so heavily on mathematics, even though you're an English professional, and but you have to know math. You have to be a critical thinker. So you have to read at the speed of light. And they will be testing your uh, language proficiency in terms of synonyms and antonyms and you know your vocabulary. 90% of the words that they will be asking you, you, you have never seen. You have never seen. So you just have to acquire or reacquire a completely new vocabulary that you have never seen and you have never used. Right now, my children going to the private school, very good one, thanks God, I'm very happy. And uh, I'm kind of observing what they're doing. And only now it became clear to me that good students were getting this training specifically long, long, long time ago, starting, let's say, from the grade even four preparation. And we are preparing ourselves to jump through this GRE. And this is a mandatory exam for everyone who wants to go to the graduate programs. So we have to learn or relearn something that they have been doing for eight years. And even they, very often cannot do it, cannot pass this GRE test. But in reality, if you prepare yourself and pass it, then there will be a reward. The reward will be very simple. When you come and you start to study, you will feel very comfortable from the day one uh, when you will be there. I remember my first foreign degree was master of business administration actually that i took in canada also um, my first six months were a disaster just it was a torture although i passed that exam but still i was so lost i was just so frustrated with myself just because i just simply could not catch up i could not understand what they want from me they were giving me an assignment, I was writing it, and I was getting F, and I had to redo it. I just could not understand what they want. So practically, again, it is not the place for the frustration, it is the place to learn. So, and you practically learn it by mistake, by, by making these mistakes and preparing yourself. And the last, once you finish your graduate degrees, it's unfortunate, but this is the reality. You will probably have about 60 days 
uh, when you have to have an offer. So is a kind of word of advice for those people who come for the uh, graduate degrees, you have to work really hard so that your grades are wonderful. Because if they are not, then you will have another difficulties. Nobody will, will want to hire you, right? So the whole idea is practically to study and then to stay and get a job in North American academia for some time. Then you can decide if you want to stay. So, but really apply all the knowledge that you have acquired. You will have 60 days between the moment of your graduation and the moment when you have to leave the country. So if in these 60 days, two months, two months, if you do not receive an offer, you have to leave the country. And if you don't, then you probably will never be able to get another position. So you will be better off to leave the country and return to your own place and continue to apply. So I remember, even though I'm a Canadian, but still the rule was exactly the same. So even for me, I would have to leave for Canada and then reapply and come back and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but you start your search again, don't be discouraged. Uh, you start your search way before that, when you already started your dissertation, for example, and you know that the dissertation is going well, you can estimate the approximate time of your graduation. So you start about one year before and search and search for the job. And again, to summarize the whole idea, I want you to remember that North, Aca North American Academia is searching for people with fresh and interesting ideas. So be sure of yourself that if you have something to offer, then they are probably searching for you. They're looking for you and they will embrace you if you can show this to them. While you do your whole studies, don't be afraid to be who you are, to develop your own ideas, not to re repeat something that someone already said before you, right? You understand sometimes when people write papers, they tend to write a paper. As someone already said 300 years ago, now I want to quote this. So it is not really necessary. Everybody knows this. So they want to know what you know, something that they do not know yet. So practically your chances will be quite strong and the possibilities are good. With this, I probably would like to finish my little talk and I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Slev, <clears throat> for your nice uh, discussion. <clears throat> on, um, in particular, I, I, I like your discussion on the difference between European universities and uh, American universities. And you nicely talked about graduate and professor relationship in universities, in North American universities, and also how um, students should prepare you know, themselves for TOEFL, GRE, um, and then apply um, to American universities. And they prefer um, like someone graduated from American universities to be recruited as faculties. Um, you know, because this is a special training, you know, uh, customized for um, those universities. So I would like to um, uh, welcome questions uh, from audience, if they have any questions. Um, so, you know what, uh, something interested, interesting happened, like I cannot see the chat box for some reason, though I know that, you know, we're supposed to, you know, uh, gather questions from uh, the chat box. So may I request Professor Hossein, because I know he can read those uh, questions um, um, to, you know, gather some questions for, you know, uh, Professor Slav. Okay, I think we should open it for the audience. If they want to ask any questions first, we should okay. take that. 
Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, anyone interested to ask any questions to Professor Slav, you can ask. You can unmute yourself and then ask your question. It's Mohammed Elwar Chahan raised hand. Thank you, sir. I wanted to ask about the economics of living and supporting yourself while you are pursuing a degree or a job in the USA. Uh, how do you support yourself uh, and uh, how do you financially support yourself, like living, food, and uh, do you get, get a part-time job, etc.? Well, finances are always an issue, of course. So I do not want to tell you uh, that you should come to America with an empty pocket. So a good idea is when you prepare yourself for the big move and for the big endeavor, you have to do maximum possible to support I mean, to ensure that there will be some additional support, financial support for yourself, right? So the maximum money that you can generate and come, because in the beginning, nobody, nobody will give you money at all. You have to come and rent an apartment, for example. Apartment, you have to pay double price for the first month and the last month, just put all this money. So if you come with $300 in the pocket, and start uh, start your graduate studies definitely it may not be sufficient right so but again on the other hand when you come and you start your studies university will give you an opportunity to work so you will be allowed according to the laws of immigration laws of the united states you will be allowed to work 20 hours a week no more no more and make some additional money so practically the survival part, yes, it is. It is a survival. The first year can be very difficult, then everything will smooth out eventually. You may not be able to buy a nice car, but you definitely will be able to buy a nice bicycle, rent a place near the university. Uh, like for example, I did. I was just riding the bicycle to my university to save money on all these little things and was living in a small, very nice and cozy apartment. But yes, you have to make an effort and uh, for you uh, to start off. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Delaware, yeah. Go ahead. Um, Anyone else would like to ask any question? Yes, it's Abdullah. Um, sure. Abdullah, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Yourself. M. You yes. are. Uh, first of all, thank you to the professor for uh, summarizing the whole idea uh, about uh, education abroad. Uh, he spoke from his experience. Uh, I think we got benefited by that. Uh, my question is, uh, if I'm not wrong, you uh, mentioned that in America, they welcome fresh ideas uh, and the education system is quite flexible and the marks depend on the students' ideas. So my question is, if there are a lot of unique ideas by the students, is it not difficult for a professor to uh, evaluate? Because, you know, when you have different ideas coming from different cultures or backgrounds uh, evaluate the core ideas? <laughs> it is a good question. You know, the good ideas are just good by themselves. I will give you this example. The book uh, that right now is being published by Toronto is the original translations of the archives that were hidden from the public for more than 25 years back in Russia. I was able to discover these archives, get the permission to translate them, comment them. And this is the first time when these archives will be uh, read and published in English. Do they have a value for that particular professor? 
for that particular professor, let's just put it this way. They may not have, but as an academic, any professor would be able, for example, to recognize the value of some original research, let's call it this way, original, something that really belongs to the humanities as an added knowledge, right? So, and uh, that would be the kind of the moment of evaluation. But still, of course, when you're a student, when you're a student, right? I don't know if you can find some groundbreaking ideas. I was not able to. <laughs> But still, still, the idea is always try to be innovative. This is what they want. They want to see you not repeating the words of someone, but they want to see your thinking process, your ability to process the information critically. And this is how they evaluate you. Thank you. Sir. When you're a student. Thank you, um, Abdullah, for your question. Um, anyone else would like to ask any question? Yes, Ryan, there is a question uh, on the, in the chat box. It is from Saif Ratul. Uh, he asked, uh, can you enlighten a bit on changing discipline given enough experience and exposure in the new discipline? Yes, so can one change discipline or how can they? If, if okay. someone has, a, yeah, if someone has a kind of exposure to the new discipline. Yes, uh, it's a very viable question. And again, it question goes back to what I was talking about. I'm education that gives everybody a freedom to be who you are. You may not be able to find yourself at the first place. You remember when I came to Canada, I did my master's of business administration because at that time I was more interested in that. So my first master's degree in North America was business. And then I worked in business for some time as a business analyst in a high tech company. And I realized that it is not something that I want to do for the rest of my life. And all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but under certain circumstances, I knew that I want to be a professor of Spanish and I changed my route completely. It is almost not possible to do in Europe for many reasons, but in America, it is absolutely possible to do. Start everything from scratch, from business to Spanish and Latin American literature. And then I continued with a PhD in the same. And right now, I don't even remember those times with business uh, because it is kind of completely alienated from me. So, see, uh, yes, it is possible. You don't have to be fixed on something. I believe that if you got your degree in this today, then you cannot really grow out of this and change your route. You can. Thank you, Ratul, uh, for your question. So, uh, Professor Slav, I was, you know, uh, listening to you, and you told us, um, like, American universities, they are more resourceful, and they give you opportunities for research. So, would you like? To, I know that you compared European universities in terms of, you know, research, um, uh, and European universities and American universities. So, would you like to compare um, between, let's say, Canadian universities? and American universities. Uh, would you say that American universities are better than Canadian universities in terms of offering opportunities to faculties? American universities to what universities? Canadian universities. Canadian universities, okay. Yes. Yes, uh, American universities are better, first of all. In Canada, all universities are public, all of them. There's no private universities at all. It means that they are much more dependent on the money that are given to them by the government. 
so the uh, the resources are more limited and they are more accountable for that money so they have to stream those money in certain places they are obligated to in canada there's only 55 universities 55 in the us there's 3500 universities and colleges that provide a postgraduate degree 3500 it is an enormous enormous amount of universities to choose from second in america also even public universities like mine marshall they have their own donors it is kind of customary in america to have donors let's say example the medical school of our university was built on the money of a wonderful couple mr and mrs edwards who donated 32 million dollars to build a building for the medical school and the medical school was established they were living all their life in this little town here and someday they decided that our university must have a medical school they gave them the money just recently i heard that the school of business again see it kind of interests me uh, our school of business that we also have received 25 million dollars it is not a grant from the government it was the gift from one of the former graduate from this school who wants to enhance and strengthen uh, the school it is unbelievable so this is see this is where all the money are coming from i mean they're coming from so many different sources in america that is given the opportunity to distribute these sources wisely uh, and spread them wide for enhancing the academy unfortunately in canada it is not the same way thank you thank you professor Slav. um now any other question anyone else would like to ask any questions you can unmute yourself and ask your question if you have any question to ask Okay, Ryan, I think uh, we can uh, just uh, wrap this session up. Uh, uh, we have already crossed one hour to sign our deals. Okay. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Slav, uh, for your nice, you know, presentation of ideas and sharing, you know, so many uh, useful information. I think our grad students they will be really, really uh, benefited from this discussion, and they will be inspired. Uh, to pursue higher studies abroad, and then from then on, you know, uh, they, they can apply to, you know, ac academic positions in North American universities. Um, with this, I'd like to invite our convener, Professor Marshall Shahid Hussain, uh, to share his ideas, and um, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ryan, and also, of course, thank you. So uh, this uh, takes us to the uh, closing or the end part of our today's session. Uh, it was an uh, engaging uh, conversation and interview that somehow helped us understand uh, the way of connection, the way of correspondence. Uh, we understand uh, to the importance of knowing uh, what North American universities and professors expect. Uh, and uh, knowing what they expect is a kind of demonstration that uh, I have worked on it and I'm committed to it. Uh, it also has a sense of complicity, a sense of conformity about it, and that somehow complicates and delimits the range and the apparent openness of what we call fresh ideas. But it is fine that there are spaces and opportunities, and maybe we can tap connection that is correspondence and correction, uh, connection uh, with efficient resource people. That might be a good and useful thing to start with. And that is something that we uh, attempted today uh, when we met and talked to uh, Dr. Slav Brecher. Uh, so uh, in order to close the discussion session, uh, let me thank uh, all the participants. I would like to thank 
our today's speaker, uh, Professor Slav Grechev, for his time and this exciting speech. Thank you, Professor Slav Grechev. Uh, I would like to thank the Department of English, the Chair of the Department, and all the teachers, uh, especially Dr. Rahan Imshuri for conducting the session, and uh, Kazi Ashrafuddin, who took all the pains uh, for this online activities and online connection. I would like to thank all the staff and the students of the Department of English. And of course, many, many thanks to the participants who joined and the people who made questions and made this session uh, more exciting and interesting. Uh, so with this, uh, we, I would like to uh, bring this uh, session to a close. Uh, and uh, again, I would like to thank uh, Professor Slav. Uh, Slav, do you have anything to say uh, as a kind of closing remark? Me? I mean, do you want to say anything at the end or uh, is it fine? No, this is fine. Thank you very much. It was my real pleasure to meet all of you and answer your questions. I hope that I was able to give you some insights uh, about this exciting academic careers in North America. Thank you and thank you everyone. We will meet again in the, uh, ne in the next week, may not be on Sunday. It will be probably on Tuesday, and on Tuesday we are, I mean, next to the next Tuesday, uh, hopefully in 27th of, on 27th October, that uh, Young Researcher Symposium, instead of one speaker, we will be, ha we will be having uh, three or four speakers, but we call Young Researchers, and that will be on spatial criticism. Uh, so thank you all, and see you again uh, in our next academic ventures and somewhere in future. Thank you and take care. Thank you.